Saddam Hussein was president of Iraq from the year 1979 until 2003. His regime bore witness to vast persecutions of his own people, and Iraq's entry into two highly destructive wars and an invasion which resulted in his own capture and execution. But yet, Saddam Hussein had begun his life in obscurity. He rose to power at a time when Iraq faced intense political instability and became president with significant support among his own people. On this episode of the History Chronicles, we will be investigating the early life of Saddam Hussein and we'll try to figure out why this son of a rural peasant ended up becoming the most powerful man in Iraq. Saddam Hussein had a humble but troubled upbringing. He was born in April 1937, in the small village of al Uja in northern Iraq. His father was a landless shepherd, his mother a fortune teller. Saddam's father died or disappeared before his son was born. His mother, Sabha, got married again to a man named Ibrahim al-Hassan, another illiterate peasant who treated his stepson poorly. Saddam's early life was marred by frequent bullying by his stepfather, who prevented him from attending school and got him involved in petty organised crime locally. It was said that Saddam as a boy would carry around an iron bar with him to defend against attack. It was Saddam's uncle on his mother's side, a man called Khairullah Tolfa, who got the young boy out of the peasantry and into politics. Tolfa was an army officer from Tikrit, who had been imprisoned from 1941 to 47 for an attempt to drive the British out of Iraq. British rule over Iraq, called the British Mandate, had officially lasted until 1938. However, British influence over oil-rich Iraq continued to be strong well into the 1940s under Iraq's new rulers, called the Hashemite dynasty. Tolfa had violently opposed the Hashemite regime, what he regarded as nothing more than mere puppets of the British. He was released from prison in 1947, but remained unapologetic about his opposition to the Iraqi state. Saddam moved in with his uncle at the age of only 12, shortly after Tolfa was released from jail. Tolfa had his young nephew attend the local school to receive some education, but he also no doubt imbued Saddam with the same sense of Arab nationalism that had led Tolfa to oppose the British-backed Hashemite regime in the 1940s. At the age of 18, Saddam moved with his uncle to the city of Baghdad. Here he tried but failed to join the Baghdad Military Academy with the aim of training as an officer in the Iraqi army. Saddam failed the entrance exam for the academy in 1957, turning his attention instead to politics in the activities of the Ba'ath Party. Ba'ath, meaning unity in Arabic, was a political party originally founded in Syria in the early 1940s. It promised its adherents unity, liberation and socialism. Its most extreme members argued for a single Arab nation to be formed out of Syria and Iraq. These two countries had, after all, been divided by more or less artificial borders created by the British and French in the Sykes-Picot Agreement of 1916. Iraq itself had hardly remained stable since the British had given up their mandate in 1938. The British-backed Hashemite dynasty had faced repeated threats from Arab nationalists such as Tolfa in the 1940s. In 1958, the government eventually fell to a coup led by Abdul Karim Qasim, an Iraqi general and communist sympathiser. The coup had seen the Hashemite royal family in Iraq executed, and a new Iraqi republic proclaimed. But, for the Ba'athists in Iraq, the coup did not go quite far enough. They had indeed formed part of General Qasim's government, but they rebuked the general for refusing to progress Iraq along the lines of becoming a united Arab Republic with other Arab states, namely with Gamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt. As a result, the Ba'athists came to actively and violently oppose Qasim's new regime. An assassination of the general was planned. One of the men that the Ba'athists chose for the assassination of General Qasim was none other than Saddam Hussein. Saddam was young, ambitious, and evidently prepared to use violence to further his political goals. On the 7th of October 1959, he and a small group of Ba'athists ambushed Qasim's car in Baghdad. However, something went wrong. It is reported that it was Saddam who began to fire prematurely, throwing off the organisation of the assassination attempt. The general's chauffeur was killed, 
but Karsim himself survived with only a bullet wound to the arm and shoulder. Retribution on the failed assassins was harsh. Six were captured and put on show trial. Here they were sentenced to death, although for an unknown reason they languished in prison rather than being executed. Saddam fled to Syria, where he was welcomed by a sympathetic Ba'athist regime. He then moved to Egypt, where he resumed his studies, graduating from high school in 1961 and pursuing a law degree for just a year before dropping out. His law studies had to end because Iraq was calling. Back in Iraq, General Qasim had now been overthrown. In 1963, opponents in the Ba'ath Party launched a coup with the military that ousted Qasim in the so-called Ramadan Revolution. Ba'athist politicians and military officers now took over the government. As for Qasim, he enjoyed a short show trial before being shot shortly after. Given that Qasim had sought to increase Iraqi influence in the Anglo-American Iraq Petroleum Company, the removal of Qasim was arguably in line with British and American foreign policy. It has been suggested that the CIA may well have played a role in engineering the coup of 1963. Another military general, Abdul Salam Mohammed Arif al Jumaili, now took over as the president of Iraq. This president, Arif, had been a key player in the revolution that had toppled the Hashemite regime. He now installed key members of the Ba'ath Party in positions of power. It wasn't long, however, before Arif grew tired of the infighting within the party and launched yet another coup d'etat that strengthened the military's hold on the government. Saddam Hussein remained in Egypt while these tumultuous power struggles took place, but he returned to Iraq after the coup with a clear intention to challenge Arif's hold on power. He knew that this time he had friends in high places. For although President Arif had removed many Ba'athists from positions of power, one had remained as a rising star in Arif's government. This was Ahmed Hassan al-Bakr, whom Harif had made Prime Minister. Al-Bakr was in fact the cousin of Khair al-Tulfa, Saddam Hussein's uncle. As such, Saddam now had an entry point into Iraqi politics that was to benefit him immensely. Upon his return to Iraq in the winter of 1963, Saddam Hussein was arrested and spent two years in prison before escaping in 1966. It is amazing that due to his family ties to the Prime Minister Bakir, he went from prison to political office in the same year. In 1966, al-Bakir appointed Saddam Deputy Secretary to the Regional Command. Here, Saddam Hussein was to play to his strengths as a skilled organiser. In this post, he developed an extensive network of political contacts and created a security service for the Ba'ath Party, which he alone controlled. Two years later, Saddam's chance for greater power finally arrived. In July 1968, he launched a coup alongside his Prime Minister al-Bakir that removed President Arif from power. The coup, known as the July Revolution, now saw Arif flee to the UK and his allies exiled with one being forced on a plane out of Iraq at gunpoint by Saddam Hussein. Al-Bakr now became the president of Iraq, with Saddam Hussein as his right-hand man. Officially, Saddam was the deputy chairman of the newly established Revolutionary Command Council. This was now the key decision-making body in Iraq, and as such, Hussein wielded immense power. Internationally, the Ba'athist takeover of the government met with a lukewarm reception, even among neighbouring Arab states. The Ba'athist government of Syria did not at first even acknowledge the formation of a new government in Iraq. Hafiz al-Assad, who took power in Syria in 1970, criticised the rule of al-Bakr and Hussein as a rightist clique. Iraqi relations with the West were now strained by the new government from the get-go. In December 1968, Iraqi troops stationed in Jordan began to shell Israeli settlers in the Jordan Valley. Retaliation by the Israeli Air Force was swift. This then precipitated arrests and public executions of Jews in Iraq, which the US Secretary of State condemned as repugnant to the conscience of the world. As the Cold War played out on the world stage, the Iraqi foreign minister also gave no doubt as to which side Iraq's new government was on. On the 2nd of August 1968, he stated that Iraq would seek close ties with the socialist camp, particularly with the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China. 
In Iraq itself, however, Saddam Hussein launched a program of reforms and investment in infrastructure which saw his popularity increase. He continued to strengthen the Ba'athist security network that he had begun under President Arif, aiming to prolong his government's stability and repress any element of opposition to the state. In June 1972, he oversaw the state seizure of the Iraqi oil industry. While this prompted a global crisis in the huge leap of the price of oil around the world, it gave the Ba'athist government in Iraq the money to develop the country's infrastructure and social services. Roads were built to connect towns and cities, Iraqi industry was diversified, and homes across the country received electricity for the first time. Educational campaigns for the eradication of illiteracy and for the freedom of education broadened the reach of schooling to much of Iraq's illiterate population. Grants were also given to support families of soldiers and to grant free hospitalisation to all citizens. Saddam even gained international recognition for his work in the shape of an award from UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organisation. However, such development did not come cheap. Saddam's money poured forth from banks that he had nationalised and had then left insolvent with massive inflation and unpaid loans. Relations with the USA had been damaged already in his takeover of Iraq's oil industry in 1972. In that same year, he also signed a treaty of friendship and cooperation with the Soviet Union, arguably upsetting the precarious Cold War balance of power in the Middle East. Neighbouring Iraq, after all, was Iran, which at this point was still ruled by the Pahlavi dynasty and was one of the USA's closest allies in the region. America helped to finance a Kurdish uprising in Iraq in 1975 that ultimately failed, but still showed the increasing friction between Iraq and the large American superpower. Hostilities were further exacerbated by the falling veneer of Iraqi democracy. The Iraqi government was not afraid of using military force to crush opponents of the state. In 1975, the uprising by the Kurds in the north of Iraq was put down with brute force. In July 1978, the Iraqi government passed a decree that banned all political activity outside of the Ba'ath Party with the punishment of death. In both Saddam's political actions and in his response to democratic opposition, it was clear that he was not winning allies for himself in the Western world. In Iraq, however, Saddam's star was in the ascendancy. His nationalisation of the oil industry was viewed as a huge triumph for the people of Iraq, who had benefited from new investment in better healthcare, education and infrastructure. Saddam also focused on improving the lives of Iraq's rural population. The 1970s saw significant advances in the mechanisation of agriculture and greater distribution of land to Iraq's peasantry. 1974-5 saw the government's expenditure on agricultural development double. In government, it was also increasingly clear that Saddam wielded more power than the ageing President Bakir. In 1976, Saddam was promoted to the position of general in the Iraqi army, giving him significant military authority. Throughout the 1970s, his face had become increasingly plastered across Iraqi towns and cities, both in his military fatigues as a warlike leader and in civilian dress as the political strongman of government. Saddam in his 40s still gave off the image of a vibrant and energetic leader. Contrast this with President al-Bakir, now in his 60s and often bedridden from a number of health concerns. As the 1970s drew on, it became increasingly clear that it was Saddam Hussein who wielded the real power in government. It was not until July of 1979, however, that Saddam Hussein formally began his tenure as the President of Iraq. Saddam had become concerned about al-Bakr's move of friendship towards the Assad regime in Syria. Such a move was actually in line with the Arab nationalist ideologies of the Ba'ath Party, which had ultimately sought a single unified Arab state in the Middle East. But such an alliance with the Syrian dictator Hafez al-Assad would undoubtedly have diluted much of Saddam's hard-earned power in Iraq. Saddam now acted quickly, in a move which very likely involved threatening his former friend and ally President Bakir. On the 16th of July 1979, Saddam Hussein forced the president to resign and to formally sign over his powers to Hussein. Saddam Hussein was now the president of Iraq. Just five days later, the new president took the first of what was to be many bloody steps towards consolidating his position. 
he called for an assembly of the Ba'ath Party leaders in Baghdad. When the large group had gathered, he strode to the front of the hall and calmly announced that there was a conspiracy in the party to undermine its aims and Saddam Hussein's position in power. One so-called leading conspirator, Muhi Abdul Hussein, then read out a total of 68 names from a list. These co-conspirators, one by one, were then led out of the room and tried together for treason. 22 were executed by firing squad. Saddam ensured that those doing the shooting were their former high-ranking colleagues in the Ba'ath Party. This was the famous Ba'ath Party purge that was to guarantee Saddam Hussein intense loyalty from those who remained in his political party. It was the start of a regime that had seen a poor illiterate peasant boy become the most powerful man in Iraq. <laughs>